It's a whodunit. You've seen one, you've seen them all. But that doesn't mean they still can't be a lot of fun, such as the case with See How They Run, directed by Tom George, who, according to his IMDb page, has done TV shows in the UK. This is his feature film debut. This was written by Mark Chappell, who has also done TV shows in the UK. And it stars Sam Rockwell and Saoirse Ronan. And I've loved Saoirse Ronan since The Lovely Bones. She was so great in that. That's a movie I will never rewatch because of the subject matter. And God damn it, oh, it's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. But she was so good. And I loved her in Hannah. God, she was great in that. And I think, I think she was, what, 16, 17 when that movie was filmed? And she was already that goddamn good. <clears throat> and then she's done other projects since. But what I think was the big breakout role for her was Lady Bird. Lady Bird was fucking phenomenal. So goddamn good. One of my favorite movies of that entire decade. Just so fucking good. And then she was in the remake of Little Women as Joe March. And she was so good in that. She's just gone from strength to strength to strength. Ammonite, which I'm pretty certain I probably butchered the name of that, but her and Kate Winslet, <clears throat> they were great in that. Sure, there's another reason why I watched that movie, but it was also well-performed. Let's just move on. I've loved Saoirse Rowan in a lot of movies, is the point. So when I saw she was in this, I'm like, okay, I'm fucking in. I think she's great. And Sam Rockwell has been great in a lot of stuff. And there were other cast members that have been in some other good things. Anya Marson, Tim Key, who plays the commissioner. Now, Commissioner Gordon, Adrian Brody, yes, the man who was the pianist. I took in the pianist. It was long and satisfying. And if, yeah, that's a long-running gag, maybe the wrong last word to use there from my time at the theater, working at the local theater in town, not the stage theater. More on the stage theater in a bit. <clears throat> um, Jacob Fortune Lloyd and then uh, Sion Clifford. There's also the character of um, <laughs> Mervyn that I'm not going to... David, and I'm not going to intend to pronounce his last name. It's oh something. Look it up. You probably can figure out why I can't pronounce it. Reed Shearsmith, Ruth Wilson, and Harris Dickinson. Um, or he just a lot of great performances in this. A lot of great cast members, and just a lot of yeah. You play around with a little bit of history. You can tweak things around, but when you have this kind of cast. Especially, again, Sam Rockwell and Saoirse fucking Ronan. I can't tell you how long it took me to realize that's how you say her name. It's a very strange way to say her name because you look at that, you don't... It just, I, it still doesn't compute. Nevertheless, she's a tremendous actress. So in this, it's set in the West End of London in the early 1950s. And there's a uh, play version of Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap. <clears throat> and even Richard Attenborough's in this. That's where Harris comes in. And they're having a tremendous goddamn run where a film adaptation is going to come up. That's like it's a hundred straight performances. There's a there's a film adaptation on on the horizon. Reese Shearsmith, he's uh, going to be you know the guy financing the goddamn thing. And then suddenly there is a death with somebody related to this particular production. <laughs> and then a murder mystery is launched where they play on the film noir aspect and the drama aspect and the playwright, you know, uh, you know, just underbelly. They play on a whole lot of genres in a really humorous way. And I can say what honestly hooked me right from the beginning was Saoirse Ronan's character, <coughs> uh, Constable Stalker. Yes, like Stalker, like actually stalking people, not Stalker like we're stalking shells. She was doing puns. Puns are the way to my fucking heart. I it's like, oh, oh, yes, perfect character. She can act and she does puns and she does them so well. This is great to see her comedic timing. And I know she's done movies where she's had comedic timing before. Lady Bird, she had some um, good comedic timing there, but that was more of a family drama. This just had great wit. It had the dry British wit, but it was really well done. Sam Rockwell was fucking great in this as Inspector Stoppard. And since it's playing around with the Agatha Christie theme, there's a lot of really good, rich writing and a lot of really good performances and some some goofy ca some goofy camera tricks that time. They do the split screen stuff and the multiple stuff. And they also try to be a little meta about, oh, we can't do flashbacks. <laughs> we can't do this stuff. What are you going to do? Have a graphic that says three weeks later, and then they had three weeks later or three weeks earlier. They just have all this stuff fucking going on. It's just, it's in the wrong hands. Like, if this cast wasn't just on their fucking game, it probably wouldn't have worked at all. 
And what actually works here is, one, Adrian Brody was really good in this. And Adrian Brody's just been fucking great in a lot of shit. I mean, when the pianist launches a goddamn career, and who doesn't love being launched by a tremendous pianist? Moving on. Not going to talk about that anymore, and delete your search history is all I will say. So, ever since then, he's been going from strength to... Sure, he's had some movies that haven't been great, but he's a really good actor. You get these components together and you can have a really good murder mystery with some great comedy and some great stuff. And it's also under two hours, well under two hours. I think it's like bell to bell an hour, an hour 38 minutes, if that. And that is a really good way to pace it. I will say that the only criticism I have, it stumbles a little bit in third act. Um, not, not in a bad way. It doesn't fall off a cliff like Murder by Death. If you've seen Murder by Death, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't quite hold the same pace as Clue, but I think there's a little bit of a stumble, but that's a minor quibble. I'm not really going to get, you know, too... I'm not going to dive too deep into that, but it was noticeable. But the performances are really what strengthened this. Again, Sir Ronan's character doing puns and Sam Rockwell being great. And also the idea that anybody could have been a suspect, going back to, um, you know, <clears throat> Jamie Candy, um, it was Randy, everybody's a suspect! But also the stage, um, the way they do the, you know, play into the stage play, and they, fact, and they bring things from that into the real world, where Rob Thomas wishes it would st just stop hassling him. If you're a Matchbox 20 fan, you're dying laughing in the comments. The whole point is, is this movie... Do, it balances a lot of uh, great things, a lot of genres, and a lot of really good performances and manages to meld them together. And yeah, the conclusion actually is kind of fitting, and it's a really good dry wit comedy <clears throat> that also, again, has Saoirse fucking Ronan in it. I mean, how can I not fucking like it? I haven't seen every single movie she's in, but I've seen more than enough to just absolutely love and adore what she does. <laughs> and... She's great. Just so many great performances. A lot of, uh, really good balance. 90% of the movie is really fucking good. And even the 10% that wasn't all that great isn't bad. It just doesn't measure up to the remaining 90% that was at the worst decent and then at, um, at its best fucking phenomenal. And that's what a lot of this movie is, is fucking phenomenal. Great balance, great character work, and great humor. Really can't ask for anything more. I could also see this movie totally dying in theaters. I could see this movie not working well. But I could see this movie having a great second life on streaming. <clears throat> and I think that's where this movie will probably end up making its, you know, the bulk of its money. Which, even with the cast, I can't imagine this movie costs more than $30 million, And even then, that might be stretching it. Beautiful locations, great scenery, <clears throat> great time period. And the conclusion was fine, and it it put enough twists and turns in there where even though you thought it was going one way, it goes this way, it does it well enough to where you don't get bored. Again, it's just that little stumble in the third act that I think takes it away from being an absolute perfect movie, <clears throat> or at least as close to perfect as a film noir comedy making fun of all this stuff can be. But it's definitely one of the best, that, uh, one of the most entertaining I've seen this year, and that's all I gotta say. So I am gonna get into spoilers. It is in theaters, though. Check it out, because I have a feeling it's probably going to leave within a few weeks. Probably be on streaming soon. So, let's get into spoilers. Three, two, one. I can't even count with my hands. Spoilers. Okay, so spoilers. Hi. So, anyway. Basically, um, <clears throat> the inspector and the constable, Sam Rockwell, search her own. They have to keep investigating. She writes a whole bunch of stuff down in her notepad. And then they find out more about the characters. It turns out that Saoirse Ronan's character is about the only one that's squeaky clean. She's worried about finding, you know, uh, passing and becoming a sergeant, passing the test. But they're trying to figure out who got murdered. Who got murdered? Adrian Brody's character got murdered. Why? He's a lecherous creep and nobody really missed him. He tried to um, <clears throat> get with a woman who was married and then he ended up getting killed. Oh my God, he got killed. And there was this narration by him. <clears throat> and then he's like, I should have suspected this. Because as he said a little bit before he got killed, the uh, biggest, you know, <clears throat> piece of shit, like the guy that nobody's really going to miss, the scumbag, gets killed. And then we have to find out who the hell killed him. <clears throat> well, the subplot comes up that Sam Rockwell had a, um, <clears throat> had a wife that 
basically confessed at eight months pregnant that it wasn't his kid, and they divorced. And then it turns out that maybe Adrian Brody's character may have been the father of the kid, so maybe Sam Rockwell had a motivation to do that. Maybe this one guy, <coughs> Mervin, had a motivation to do that, because him and Adrian Brody were arguing about this particular screenplay for the adaptation of The Mousetrap. And maybe the producer, played by uh, Reese Shearsmith, maybe he had a reason, because it turned out he was actually gay, or had a gay affair with... Um, Adrian Brody's character. Everybody just was either with Adrian Brody or staying over Adrian Brody ready to bash his head in. Also, he got in a fight with a waiter. <clears throat> so, uh-oh, there's something a little bit wrong there. Why would you get, well, he, he actually got in a fight with the guy whose wife he was flirting with. But then there's the waiter, the waiter, the usher. What the hell's going on with the usher? <clears throat> because the usher was just there in the background. Nobody would suspect the usher. Well, gee, I wonder who the fuck it actually was. Who could it have been? Well, obviously, if it's the usher, I gotta be telling you it's the usher. But why would it be the usher? Because it's not Sam Rockwell. Because Sam Rockwell didn't do that. That'd be too goddamn obvious. Be too much of a red herring. Um, with a heading. So it's not him. Why would it be the usher, though? It turns out there was this little bit of newspaper, <clears throat> you know, a couple newspaper articles about two orphan boys, one that wasn't taken care of very well, <clears throat> and end up dying through a variety of things, you know, through a variety of, uh, you know, neglectful things. Turns out the mousetrap was based on this, and the brother didn't like seeing that particular tragedy played out <clears throat> and the pain being mocked. Since he was an usher, he had to witness that whole thing time after time after time after time after time, and he finally snapped. He forged a whole bunch of cards, got a whole bunch of people at the house, <clears throat> um, and tried to get, uh, in, in, whose house was this? Agatha Christie's house. He tried to take down the playwright, take down the author. He says, I'm going to go straight to the goddamn source. And then Agatha Christie um, gets captured, oh, except she doesn't get captured. It actually is Reese Shearsmith's um, um, soon-to-be ex-wife because he's flirting with his uh, assistant and going to marry his assistant, even though he had a gay affair with Adrian Brody. I'm not here to kink shame at all, but hmm, guy doesn't seem that trustworthy. But this usher, he's just there and he's all upset. And then they have this long discussion where he's sitting down. He's got his rifle thing there. And he's all, he's just all upset, all distraught. Before I get to the end, though, got to go back to when Adrian Brody was pitching his own storyboard ideas about a face-off between the cop and the criminal. The cop fires once, hits a guy in the gut, hits a guy in the knee, but then his gun jams. And the the villain gets the, uh, gets the rifle and is going to shoot him. And then the cop's partner jumps in the way to get to take the bullet. So, now that that's going on, it turns out that the person that he had wrapped in the rug wasn't actually Agatha Christie. It was Reese Shearsmith's soon-to-be ex-wife. Agatha Christie comes up with a way to rat poison one of the teacups <clears throat> and give it to this usher. Well, the usher ends up... Um, well, the usher ends up not getting the uh, thing because it gets spun around, even though she should have marked the cup a little bit better, might have given it away. And the butler that answered the door ends up dying. And then the usher's all freaking out. <clears throat> and then somebody comes up with this idea, hey, I need a light. I'm going to light a malt of cocktail, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to scare the usher. And then Sam Rockwell um, and Sir Ronan, they were driving through the snow in separate cars, he manages to shoot him once and then shoot him in the knee, but then his gun jams, just like Adrian Brody's character said. <clears throat> and then he ends up, um, he, he ends up, oh my God, what the hell is going on? Like, you know, I'm, I'm done. And then Sir Sharon tries to jump in the way of it. But then, it, then um, the usher gets killed because Agatha Christie hits him with a shovel. And then he's going to stab him with it. It's like, no, no, ma'am, no, he's dead. He's bleeding from the back of the head. So there you go. Don't mess with Agatha Christie is the whole point of this movie. I don't think that's it, but that's one of the points. <clears throat> and then it turns out that Sir Sharon actually didn't take the bullet at all that Sam Rockwell got shot. She tried to do a noble effort. He got saved, though. He got honored. <clears throat> she got, um, she passed the sergeant exam. And then <clears throat> we, find, we just find out uh, all that about the characters. And that wraps up the nice, neat little mystery. It's a really good... It's really good. It's really enjoyable. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to give it an A. 
it, it goes down from an A plus just because of that stumble. And I think there were a couple a couple quibbles that I just can't ignore. I'm giving it an A though because it's uh it goes from strength to strength to strength. And it is one of my favorite films of the year, but it's probably gonna miss out on the top 15. That being said, it's been a hell of a year. So that's all I gotta say about that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rentlin. I'll see you soon.